Hello, it's November. It's time for another question and answer show here on Watch It Played. I'm Matthew and together with a bunch of your help, let's answer all of the internet's burning board game questions. I get a lot of questions on this show that I don't think necessitate a full at length answer. So this week, <laughs> we're gonna do a quick fire episode. And we're starting off hot with something that many a board gamer has pondered throughout the years, is what is the best box size? I mean, the thing probably to talk about most is while there aren't box sizes that I really love, there are certainly box sizes that I hate. <laughs> What is this? Pizza Pizza, fantastic word game. I'd advise anyone to get it. I know it looks like a slice of pizza. Why? Where am I gonna put it? One of the first things I think about when I'm in a board game shop, like actually in the shop, gonna buy a game, browsing the actual physical shelves. Like that's something that people really do. You look at the box sizes, and I tell you what, if your game is in an Advent Guard sized box, you're going down a few rungs of the I'm gonna get it level. There have been games I've straight up not got because I'm angry at the box size. And while I'll leave you to wonder what they could be, I will say that I'm a massive fan of what we all call, I think, the Seven Wonders Dual Box Size. You know, it's just a little square. Games like Daxu and Asante and Lost Cities, all those little, all those perfect box sizes. They're squares, they stack, and there's very often a two-player game inside, but not always, but there's very often a brilliant game in a small little package, and that's something I really love. So I'm going to go with that. What's your favourite game in that box size? There are so many good ones. I love it. Something else I love, of course, is the sponsor who in part helped make this episode possible. This episode is made possible by Gamers.Online. Are you looking for a group of gaming friends? Gamers.Online has you covered. Whether your passion is playing on a tabletop, console, RPG, mobile, or something else, you can discover an entire network of gamers near you and all over the world with Gamers.Online, an app that manages your gamer resume, your gaming events, and showcases your gamer world ranking. I'm hoping I can set mine to private because my win-loss ratio is not great. Find fellow gamers by gaming preference, distance to you, or who might be up for playing your favorite game. Manage your complete game collection and wish list, including tabletop, computer, and console games. Then track the results of every game you play, building your worldwide rank in your favorite games. This is something I wish had existed when I first moved to this area, because I didn't know who the gamers were or how to easily find them, and this is something that could have really helped. Follow the link in this video's description to find out more and get started on gamers.online and get yourself in the game. Next question, should you get rid of inserts? Yes. Look, most of those inserts are so that your game doesn't get smashed around when it's on a freight ship in the Taiwan Strait. Let's be real about it. They're often not meant to be used. My f thing with inserts is that they're never good, are they? <laughs> <laughs> They're so rarely good. Those kind of like vacuum formed ones that you get, which are kind of a standard board game insert and they just put any game in it. They're just why. And the ones that are perfectly formed around every single crevice and piece that don't work, the second your game gets turned upside down, it's gone to hell, right? It looks like a wormhole opened inside there. When you open it up, pieces are everywhere, coins are in under the insert and then the board is upside down. It's, you don't like that. They're rubbish. Board game inserts as well cost a lot of money to produce because they're like a, you know, specific plastic piece for a game. I say get rid of all of them. Get rid of all board game inserts, mostly. I'm probably going to go back on that in a second. Make the games cheaper. I think that's a great plan. But the next question is, what is the best board game insert? I will go and say anything that folded space make. I know that that's a cheat to that answer because they're an insert creating company. Who I'm friends with, they're from Bulgaria. I've been to their offices, they're great people. So I'll take this with a pinch of salt, I suppose. But folded space inserts are great. I'm always gonna pitch those to people. But I think they mean, what is the best board game insert that comes with a game? We open the box up and you go, wow, this insert's ace. 
I'm really happy with it. I have no examples. It's that hard to do. I have zero examples for it. The best board game insert is any game that comes with enough baggies to put things in. Prove me wrong. Up next we have, does art matter? A lot of these questions are pitched to me very succinctly. <laughs> does art matter in games? Obviously it does. Of course it does, it's marketing. It's like you wouldn't produce a, a movie and then not market the movie and put a nice a, a trailer for the film and stuff like that, would you? I do think, however, great mechanisms in a board game can shine through terrible art. I won't show you where they are, but there are certainly examples of that, many of them are surrounding me right now. However, great art can't save a bad board game. I just don't think it can. Are there games I bought be just because the art was so cool and awesome? I don't know if that's something that I've done. I've certainly been swayed. The marketing part of the artwork, you know, swayed to buy something or even swayed to buy something again. Sometimes artwork can make you look at a game in a fresh light because, you know, have you, see have you seen the Polish version of Battle Line? It's amazing. I want to buy that game again. The question really comes down to, I think a lot of the time, is such a subjective nature right it's like i like the way that this dusty euro i love the look of a dusty euro something that many people say oh i hate that another game is set in the mediterranean or another game about a european city i love that type of artwork there are though a couple examples of games that i own that i've considered buying again just because of the art and it's not because i want the art to be any better it's because oh jeez, i should have got this it's not, it's because I want other people to play the game and I think I'd have a better chance if I got the new version. The new version of <laughs> Too Many Cooks. This is Too Many Cooks. Brilliant art. Love it. Absolutely fantastic. You are, everything is an anthropomorphized uh, vegetable. Look at these people. It's, fan ah, it's just brilliant. It's pretty difficult to get people to play this game. However, Foodie Forest from Yellow is out now. And that's absolutely gorgeous. And I think I can get people to play Foodie Forest easier than this, whatever this is. <laughs> but it's such a great game. So sometimes art really does matter in some ways. The next question is favorite player count for games. Not even fully fleshed out as a sentence, but that's what we've got. And for me, the favorite player count in a game rather depends on the game, doesn't it? Favorite player count for Lost Cities? Two, because it's a two player game. But I, I know they're asking, like they mean like, I feel like the question is, you know, you get those big games that play two to five, what's your favorite player count for those type of games? I mean, my favorite player count for Fuji Flush is as many people as there are sitting around the table. I get 10 people. How many players does Fuji Flush play? <sighs> I want to say eight, three to eight professional board gamer. But I've played this with like 15. There aren't enough cards. You can get a couple of copies of this though together and then play it to 15. You know, the more the merrier for me. I'm going to say three. I mean, honestly, I like to play with as many people as possible because I much more care about the people in the game most often. But yeah, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say three, three people. Next we have least favorite board game mechanism. Again, no one's gonna like this, but it depends. I mean, case in point, most people don't like player elimination and in a game like Red 7, that makes the game so much fun. The player elimination aspect. In the game, what you're trying to do is stay in till the end of the round, and then you can score your points, and you wanna be in as long as possible, but you are gonna get eliminated from round to round. You're back in the next round, but you're trying to play a card down so that the conditions on the board mean that you are still winning the trick, essentially. 
it's kind of a trick-taking game in that way. It really doesn't feel like a trick-taking game in any other way. You know, sometimes it means you have the highest card, I have the most odd cards, I have the longest run of cards, and you've got to play a card either to your tableau of cards, which makes the rule that's out on the table true, or a new rule out on the table to make your tableau the winning winning. It's great, and it works because of player elimination. Another thing that people don't really like is roll and move. And I understand why people don't like roll and move, but now I'm going to say this, and I'll probably put a warning here now, because this might be controversial. I'd argue Can't Stop is a roll and move game. You roll your dice, you move up the tracks. It's pretty much roll and move. Great game. So it, may, it just depends on the context. I think the thing I least like in games, my least favourite mechanism, is random events. <laughs> I, I've played some games where they have, uh, it's a random event will come up and just by chance, I survived that event. That's no problem for me. You, devastated. Everything you've worked towards, gone. That's just disappeared now. <laughs> I, hate it. I hate it so much. It really can sour me towards a game. I know that, you know, it's like, well, if you learn what's in the deck, what kind of thing might come up and you can ca card count the events and know that this might be... Fine, I appreciate that. But random events, I'm just not a big fan of. The next question is, do you prefer to host games or go elsewhere? Easy, go elsewhere. Don't come to my house. I don't want people here. I don't want to host. I don't want people touching my stuff, but I do love going to people's houses. And the reason is twofold. Fold one, I can go through your fridge and just have a look. I don't want to eat anything. I'm not going to take anything. I just need to look in your fridge. I have to do that. That's something that's a deep ingrained part of my personality. I'm interested in what's in your fridge. Second thing, I can leave. Just go, go whenever I want. If you're all at my house, I have to wait for you to leave. No, the actual, prime move is to go somewhere else and then leave at will. Halfway through a game, I'm done, I'm gone. <laughs> gone. Ghost. You won't see me again for six months. And finally, we have our first player conditions dumb or fun? First player conditions in games where it's like the person who last watered a plant, the person who last climbed Everest. The, I love them. I think it just shows a little bit of whimsy in the game. A little bit of you know, you need to have a first player. It's just more fun than reading, pick a first player at random. I mean, a lot of times I feel like if there's a strict advantage to going first, it should be the youngest or the least experienced gamer of this game should go first. And that's fine, like as a balancing mechanism. But I just think it's fun when it's the last person to have eaten cheese. I mean, not that specifically, because it's never going to be me, because cheese is awful. But something fun, I, I played a game called Perch recently, which is from Inside Up Games, and it's, I think it was on, it was on Kickstarter. They had a first player whole mechanism where you had this like coaster and you have to flick your player token at the coaster and the person who is closest to this coaster gets to go first. That is the best first player mechanism I've ever had because it's a whole mini game. It came with an extra component just to pick first player and I thought it was fun and it, what it did was it set everyone up with a light-hearted feeling which is good because that game is just devastatingly mean. I really enjoyed it. It was sponsored so take it with a pinch of salt but I thought it was really good. So just those extra thought and care taken in on that. This is flicking, if you're wondering what that is. I just think that's fun. I really like them. I like a fun, silly first player condition. Why not? And that is another month of questions asked and dare I say answered. If you have any questions, comments or concerns about my answers, but more importantly, answers of your own for any of the questions we spoke about this month, let me know, put them in the comments. I can't wait to see what you have to say. Was I wrong? Really? You think me, a man on the internet, could possibly be wrong about something? With the confidence with which I'm talking? <laughs> that's, in, that's nonsense. Thank you so much for watching another episode of the Watch It Played Q&A, and I'll see you next month. Until then, bye.